Hello everybody and welcome to Obux Presents. Uh, at Obux Presents we are um, showcasing and exploring new authors in the mind, body, spirit world and uh, it's your place to discover uh, cutting edge new voices in that sphere. Today we've got Bernardo Casarup with us and he's an, a prolific author with a PhD in computer engineering with specializations in artificial intelligence and reconfigurable computing. He has worked as a scientist in some of the world's foremost research laboratories, including uh, the European Organization for Nuclear Research, which is CERN or CERN? CERN, CERN yes, yeah. CERN. And the Philips Research Laboratories, uh, where the Casimir effect and the quantum field theory was discovered. Bernardo has authored many academic papers and books on philosophy and science. His three most recent books are More Than Allegory, Brief Peaks Beyond, and Why Materialism is Baloney. Uh, hello, Bernardo. Hi there, Ben. Nice okay. to see you. Uh, nice to have you on. Now, there's so much we can talk about and so much you have to say. And for the purposes of the next um, 30 minutes to an hour, we're going to talk about um, why materialism is baloney, which is one of your books that's doing really well with us, and um, uh, what the subjects you explore, which is mainly the problem of consciousness. Would you say that's right? That's right. Uh, yeah. The nature of consciousness in regards to the nature of reality. The nature of consciousness in regards to the nature of reality. Excellent. And and my understanding, and you can correct me if I'm if I'm wrong, uh, that the materialistic sort of uh, more um which is view of science which is more status quo these days although it is changing uh kind of likes to posit that our consciousness inside our heads um that we feel that we experience is something that's created by our brains although no one can actually really has ever come close to proving that and that's i think that's quite a good um uh starting Point. Can you can you sort of talk a bit about that and where the current that current point of view is, and how how that is? Yeah, well, we we use the word materialism in, in two distinct uh, senses, right? And uh, there is a popular sense in which we say, well, somebody is a materialist if he likes to buy stuff and accumulate things and earn a lot of money. Uh, that's ethical materialism. And then there is what philosophers call ontological materialism, which is the idea that uh, nature is such that all there is is matter and that matter is fundamentally outside and independent of consciousness and that particular complex arrangements of matter in the form of brains somehow in a way that nobody has ever come close to understanding <laughs> generates or constitutes uh, consciousness generates experience mm. um, it this is a, 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 a postulate uh, uh, it has never been proven I would argue it can't be be proven because it's 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 just wrong mm. uh, but uh, it's a hypothesis that uh, dominates philosophy and science today yeah lovely and you, you said it can um, well it's hard to prove and it can never be proven and people have had a lot of trouble trying to prove it um, you talk in the book um, about materialism why materialism is a baloney about neuroscience specifically and why what what it is about neuroscience that in neuroscience that makes it so difficult to discover this kind of to, to, to see the brain creating our sense of consciousness yeah, we, we fundamentally can't do that yeah. what we can do is we can uh, detect very nice tight correlations between mm. what people report they experience mm. and the patterns of brain activity that we can measure in their brains yeah. um, we also know from direct experience that there is a correlation between material brain activity and experience I mean if I drink alcohol I put blood I put blood I put alcohol <laughs> in my bloodstream uh, which then goes into my brain and I have a, a, a change in my experience of the world if alcohol is, is in my brain or if somebody punches me in the head, um, you know, I may blank. And, and um, uh, so th th there are clear indications, well, 
there, there is, it's clearly established yeah. that there is a correlation between what we call patterns of material brain activity and experience. Now, the problem is that uh, correlation doesn't imply causation. Uh, and we don't understand even the nature of matter itself. Uh, we can detect these patterns of brain activity and we, and we label it as matter. But what does that mean? What is matter? I mean, uh, I, I, I measure brain, what we call brain activity on the one hand. It correlates with the experience on the other hand. But ultimately, both of these things are experiences. Mm. What I call patterns of brain activity, I only know that insofar as I experience it by looking at the output of a, of a brain scan, a functional brain scan. Um, now, what materialists say is that behind the experience we call a pattern of brain activity, there is something beyond experience that underlies it, something that is constituted of mass, charge, momentum, spin, all these properties of matter. But then there is nothing about mass, charge, momentum, and spin in terms of which I could deduce how it feels to see red, mm -hmm. how it feels to have a bellyache, how it feels to fall in love or to feel regret. Uh, these, these two things seem to be completely disjoint worlds, although there is an obvious, undeniable correlation between the two. I think the answer lies not in trying to explain the qualities of experience in terms of mass, charge, spin, and momentum, mm -hmm. the answer lies in realizing that matter itself only exists in so far as it itself is an experience. That uh, what we call matter is merely the extrinsic appearance, the outside image of conscious inner life, and that there is th th this is all there is to it. There is nothing more to matter than that it is the outside image, the extrinsic appearance of conscious in their life. Nice. So that's the leap you're making rather than say, if I feel happy and then the happy bit of my brain in the scan lights up or part of my brain associated with happiness lights up and making the assumption that, that the, the matter is causing the happiness. Correct. Um, you're, you're saying, um, you just put it so well, say, say it again <laughs> one more time. Yeah, so, uh, okay, you're happy. There's a yeah. part of your brain, the happy part, that lights up. Yeah. Materialists would say, well, that part of your brain uh, is matter outside experience and it generates experience. Yeah. What I would say is that part of your brain, the happy part that lights up, it's the image, the outside image, the second person mm. view of the happiness that you feel. And that outside image, that second person view, is itself an experience because we only know it insofar as we experience it by measuring it. Yeah. And then I would say that uh, all matter is like that. I mean, nature gives us these clues. Um, we know, uh, you know, a brain is a very, quote, material object that can hold it, mm. a neurosurgeon can slice it, mm. uh, can touch it, can cauterize it, mm. uh, very material. Um, and yet we know that underlying or behind, somehow behind that material ob object, there is the conscious inner life of a person mm -hmm. with, you know, uh, successes and failures, regrets, loves, disappointments, pain, pleasure, great adventures, s sorrows. Uh, uh, so clearly, in the case of a brain, matter is the image of conscious inner life. Mm -hmm. I would say that that's the case for everything in the sense that the inanimate universe as a whole it's also the extrinsic appearance or the outside image or the second person perspective of conscious in their life. And as it turns out, uh, we have now been able to study uh, the structure of the universe at its largest scales, you know, galaxies and galaxy clusters. And that structure, this is circumstantial, but it's interesting, mm -hmm. that structure is surprisingly similar to the structure of a nervous system. Yeah. So that's fascinating. So there's a couple of things. So it's almost like the pattern or the structure of the the whole big universe is like a representation of what's going on on a macro level, like a micro level with us. And tell tell me if, if this is the right reading. What you were saying is almost like um, the physical reality, what's going on in matter in the universe is almost like what yours is a reflection of the of the inner consciousness of the whole universe. Yeah, yeah, I think there is only consciousness. I think there is only universal consciousness. Yeah. Uh, materialists would say there is only 
the physical aspect of things, I would say there is only consciousness and what we call physical is itself an experience in consciousness. Mm. Now, how if there is only one universal consciousness, you have to explain why my inner life is private. You cannot read my thoughts and mm. I cannot read yours. Uh, and, I, and I'm not aware of what's going on across the universe. So somehow my conscious inner life seems to become separated from the rest Mm. Even though I'm postulating that there is only one universal consciousness, I would compare that, and that's the analogy I make in a book. Um, you know, imagine that you have a stream, yeah. and that water represents consciousness or conscious experiences, and imagine that a whirlpool form in that forms in that stream. Uh, that whirlpool would be a localization of experience, and it somehow separates the experience within it from the experience outside of it. At the end of the day, there is only the stream. There is only water. But the patterns of behavior of the stream, of the water, or of conscious experience are such that they form these local uh, centers of consciousness, if you will, which we can yeah. visualize uh, as whirlpools. I would say uh, the stream is the entire un universe. Yeah. And the whirlpools, the, the way the whirlpools look like, uh, is uh, like a conscious living beings. I am a whirlpool in universal consciousness. So are you. So is uh, an amoeba. So is a tree. And so on and so forth. And the rest of the universe, which is not alive, the, un the inanimate universe as a whole, in other words, the stream except for the whirlpools, mm. is also consciousness. It's also water. It's the same stream. There is only the stream going on. And, uh, and what we call inanimate matter are just bits and pieces of what the conscious inner life of the universe, the inanimate yeah. universe, universal conscious inner life, if you will, looks like from the point of view of the whirlpools. Yeah, lovely. And so we're like whirlpools in the riv river of consciousness. And, you know, whirlpools are temporary things. We come, we spin around and then we go back into the river kind of thing there you go yeah. and they are temporary <laughs> things as a pattern of behavior yeah. but the water in the whirlpool never disappears nothing yeah. is ever lost uh, um, so if the whirlpool is a localization of consciousness that creates this illusion of personal identity mm. uh, and the body of a living being is the whirlpool is what that localization looks like what is death death would be the end of the localization but yeah. nothing is lost. Uh, you, you're just, you no longer, you would just not think anymore, not believe anymore that you're separate from the rest. You would just be absorbed back into the stream and you would be the stream again, mm. which you actually never cease to be because there's nothing to the whirlpool, <laughs> but yeah. the stream in movement. Uh, yeah, you would go back and you would be into the stream. I think for me, I think for some people when they're first engaging with this kind of thought is... um. The hardest thing is 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 to um, it's that sense of being separate to think. Hold on, that my con consciousness is somehow everywhere. So it's hard to get your head round. But um, but the the you know the whirlpool analogy is is nice. Yeah, I mean um, it, it's an accessible analogy. We we could go really, you know scientific on this and uh, mm. we know in science that there is this phenomenon called uh, dissociation mm. there are people with uh, a condition called dissociative identity disorder it used to be called multiple personality disorder mm. parts of their consciousness sort of split off become dissociated from the rest and they acquire multiple personalities and um, a couple of years ago it was shown in germany um, a woman had multiple dissociated personalities which are technically called alters mm. And some of the alters claimed to be blind, and some of the alters could see. Mm. So, and doctors were able to show that when a blind alter was in control of the woman's body, that mm. dissociated personality had executive control, uh, and no brain activity related to vision could be detected as an EEG, even though the woman had her eyes wi wide open. Uh, and when uh, a sighted alter would then assume executive control and be in control of the woman's body, mm. uh, the brain activity related to sight would come back, would be measurable again. So what this shows is that uh, dissociation is uh, it's literally blinding. Mm. It can really isolate a, 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 a locus of consciousness from the rest of consciousness, even in the psyche of a person, a yeah. single person. There is no question 
that the alters of this woman were all ultimately parts of the same psyche. It's the same woman. It's only one woman in question. Mm -hmm. And despite that, dissociation could carve out these separate identities to the point that they would become literally blind to what else was going on uh, in that psyche. I would claim that uh, whirlpools are dissociative uh, 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 phenomena in universal consciousness mm -hmm. and we become as whirlpools as dissociated alters dissociated personalities of universal consciousness yeah. we become blind to whatever whatever is going on outside uh, the whirlpools for the same reason that an alter of this woman would become literally blind yeah. um, so dissociation is very powerful whirlpool formation is very powerful in creating this illusion of personal identity because it cuts off access to whatever else is going on in mind lovely and would you would you also agree that by by you know whatever f form attracts you whether it's you know sort of religious stuff or meditative stuff or engaging with ideas and, and science of view that intellectually and with the mind um you can to a certain extent change your sense of dissociation and you can feel a bit more connected to the whole yes i th i think so um again we can go scientific on this there yeah. are many uh, um, many phenomena that are associated with reduction in brain activity. So, you see, what I'm saying is that normal brain activity is the image of dissociation, is the image of the whirlpool formation, the localization of conscious experience that creates this illusion of personal identity. Yeah. So, reduction in brain activity should be a reduction in dissociation, a reduction in localization. Yeah. It should give you access to a broader scope of conscious experience, a sort of self-transcendence, if you wish. Mm. Um, and it turns out that this is exactly what happens. I mean, teenagers worldwide play this very dangerous game called the choking game, yeah. in which they partly choke themselves, reduce blood flow to the brain, reduce brain activity, and they have these wonderful transpersonal experiences that are almost addictive. Yeah. Um, we, we know since 2012, and this has been confirmed repeatedly, that psychedelics do nothing but reduce brain activity. They do not excite the brain, they dampen brain activity. They increase the synchronization between brain areas, but the activity goes down. Yeah. Uh, and hey, you have in fantastic transcendent, transcendence experiences, self-transcendence experiences, uh, or uh, the list the list is enormous. Uh, uh, pilots undergoing G-force training in which blood is drained out of their heads. Mm -hmm. They report also dreams of, of a transpersonal uh, uh, character. People who go through NDEs in which the heart stops, they also have transpersonal experiences of expanded consciousness. They even took mediums in Brazil in a study in 2013, yeah. uh, experienced mediums who claimed that they could write down information coming from a transpersonal source. Yeah. So they would have to transcend their personal boundaries to access this source and transcribe information. So they put these guys psychographing which is this uh, a while in a brain scanner and it turned out that the brain activity was significantly dampened while they were entranced and writing down text mm -hmm. and they compared then the complexity of the text they wrote down with this dampened brain activity with text they would write under normal conditions and the, the text written under trance, reduced brain activity, was much more complex, which is mind-boggling. It should have been the other way around. You know, yeah. key areas of the brain involved in articulating words were dampened. How could they write even more complex text? So the list goes on. So, yeah. and this I, is I think, this is all kind of evidence against the the materialistic view that the brain by itself creates your internal world, because by that logic less activity should mean less internal life and That's less correct. experience and you're saying the, the the less activity enhanced experience yeah. That's correct not not less activity in general because you see uh, okay let me explain this yeah. materialism would say that because experience is brain activity or is generated by, by brain activity and there's nothing to experience but brain activity mm. Under materialism, all reductions of, reductions of brain activity should lead to reduced experience, less intense experience, less experience, and so on. Mm. Uh, what I'm saying is that um, normal brain activity is the image of dissociated experience, localized experience, the whirlpool. Yeah. But you see, there are big whirlpools and there are small whirlpools. So some reductions of brain activity should lead to less experience in the sense that it just makes the whirlpool smaller, mm. if you know what I mean. 
But some reductions of brain activity should disrupt the boundaries of the whirlpool. So the whirlpool would sort of release its center into the broader stream and it would become diffuse and not sharply defined. Yeah. Some cases of brain activity reduction, not all, but some at least. And as it turns out, some cases of reduction of brain activity do consistently correlate with enhanced consciousness, yeah. which under my view is explainable and under materialism should never happen. Yeah, nice. And I think you... I don't know if this is a good, perfect example of what you just said, um, but uh, some you said some examples of you know reduced brain activity they sort of lessen the normal boundaries, the, the sense of dissociation. You mentioned Jill Bolt Taylor, who had a, right. str a stroke. Who was a she was a scientist, wasn't she? She had a stroke and a lot of blood was cut off to her head, and then she had the unusual sensation of merging with everything <laughs> with the rest of the universe there yeah. you go yeah so uh, uh, her left brain left hemisphere activity was disrupted because mm. there was much reduced blood flow so metabolism goes down and her subjective experience of it was of a uh, yeah merging of uh, she used the words i felt like a genie liberated from the bottle wow i felt mm. like a great whale gliding in an ocean of silent euphoria i remember her words uh, yeah. exactly <laughs> yeah uh, and then she felt that she could never be compressed again into that tiny little body of hers because she was much broader than the body. Well, this is a description of a whirlpool being disrupted and releasing the center of consciousness into the broader stream. Mm -hmm. And from the point of view of the stream, how can the stream go back to the little boundaries of a whirlpool? Mm -hmm. You will never fit in there again, uh, right? And yeah. I think that was her direct experience of what happens when we die. Yeah, lovely. And... Um... So I just want to shift gears slightly because we've been talking a lot about stream and the whirlpool has been our kind of image for for the ideas that you're talking about. Um, but one of the other in the material, why materialism is baloney book, you talk about instead of our mind being inside us, we're inside the mind. That's another way of thinking about it. Maybe you could say something about that. Yeah. yeah. Materialism would say that because your mind, your consciousness is generated by your brain, Mm. Um, then it is your mind that is inside your body. Mm. See, if your mind is constituted by brain activity and your brain is inside your skull, then your mind is inside your skull. It's inside your body and your body surrounds your mind. So under materialism, and very few people stop to think about it, your entire conscious life, everything you have ever experienced, including the stars in the night sky, mm. all happened within your skull. Under materialism, everything I'm seeing right now, the computer in front of me, the office around me, as, uh, insofar as it is experienced, it's inside my skull. My real skull is somewhere beyond everything I'm experiencing. Yeah. When I look, to the, look, look up to the skies at night, insofar as I experience the stars, my real skull is beyond the stars. Because the stars I experienced are inside my skull. That's what materialism implies. It's absurd, but that's what materialism implies. Uh, so under materialism, the mind is inside your body. Yeah. What I say is that your body only exists insofar as you experience it. What is your body but a set of consistent experiences? Something I touch, something I see, something I smell, something I feel internally through internal perception. These are all experiences but I experience also more than my body. I experience the office, I experience you, I experience the stars in the night sky. So clearly, insofar as my body is an experience, my body is inside my mind, because it's my mind that experiences. Yeah. So my claim is, the body is inside mind. It's just that mind is not only your personal mind. Mind is universal mind, <coughs> and your body exists as an experience within universal uh, mind. Yeah. Nice. So your body exists in as an experience in universal mind. And it's it. It's it's it's. Hard. I think if you've never thought about it that way, it's quite hard to get your head round. But the way you put it, like, like you said, uh, correct, correct me if I've got this right. That your body is, is something. If you if you really think about it, it's something that you experience in your field mind. Of, mind of consciousness. Yeah, yeah. yeah your sense perceptions, what you're feeling, 
what you're seeing, what you're smelling, and then all the other stuff. So it's a, the leap is then that somehow the body appears within your mind and then eventually exactly. will disappear. Exactly. Yeah. The, the, the body happens within your mind. Yeah. Uh, birth and death are events that happen within mind. Yeah. They are the birth of a whirlpool, the formation of a whirlpool, and the dissolution of a whirlpool. They happen within the stream. Mm. They happen within mind. What you ultimately are is the stream. Uh, but because the stream localizes in the form of whirlpools, uh, your field of experience gets reduced and restricted during life and, and leads you to identify yourself with that restriction mm. as opposed to the original stream. Nice. And would you say that there's more and more science is changing, you know, more and more science which represents this, this perspective? Huh. Uh, science is uh, neutral regarding mm. the nature of consciousness or the nature of reality. What science does, if it's done correctly, mm. is to identify the regularities of the behavior of nature. Mm. Science is all about the structure and the behavior of nature, mm. not what nature intrinsically is. Mm. Science is not about what it is, it's about what it does. Yeah. And that's why science is so important for technology, because if you know how nature behaves and we can predict its behavior, we can build technology around those predictions. Mm. Um, uh, so I would say from that perspective, the behaviors of nature that science has been identifying very much support my point of view and mm. contradict materialism. Uh, we see that in experiments related to quantum entanglement yeah. uh, that contradict a notion called non-contextuality, this idea that uh, what you measure is independent of other measurements. And it turns out that it's not. It turns out that the physical world depends on how you look at it, depends on how you observe it, which contradicts materialism, but is okay under my view that there is only consciousness. Mm. Um, and also in neuroscience, uh, as I mentioned, there are these anomalies, these cases in which reductions of brain activity leads to broader as opposed to more restricted experience. So it's quite there's quite an interesting time where there's a kind of a shifting of a scientific paradigm in terms of the, the way it's analyzing patterns of behavior of material. Uh, absolutely. Like. I mean, uh, uh, I'm part of a a group of people, I can't review their names, but I'm part of a group of people that uh, uh, we are very much convinced that uh, paradigm changing is coming. Uh, yeah. The question we ask ourselves, and we have different ages, is mm. uh, will it happen within our lifetimes? Yeah. <laughs> uh, that, 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 that's the only question. Um, I am 43 years old. I think if I, uh, if I attain um, the average lifetime for a male in the Netherlands, uh, which I have every reason to believe I could, uh, it would certainly happen well within my lifetime. I think it will happen in 20, 30 years. Yeah. Lovely. And you know, what's so clear from talking to you and it's clear in your writing as well is you know, your, your, you know, your grasp on all of the, these ideas and concepts. And I, I like the dexterity, being able to work, jump between them and work between them. But I mean, would you, uh, uh, you primarily work as a scientist, is that right? Or how would not you? Not anymore, yeah. not anymore. I earn a living now doing uh, um, a corporate strategy for yeah. a large technology corporation. I So, so it's kind of um, still around the technology. It's thing. very much science oriented. Uh, the corporation I work for uh, deals on the, the leading edge of science, the leading edge yeah. of what is at all possible given what of what given what we know about nature some would say we even go across that boundary we do things that shouldn't be possible yeah. um so science is still very much a part of my life but i don't do science anymore i now use science uh, uh, in, in my day job but my day job is half of my life the other half of my life is philosophy yeah. neuroscience and foundations of physics the three things i i, I publish uh, uh, on in, in, in academic journals Lovely, and um, and I think that there's like I think there's a big hunger for the kind of um, writing like yours at the moment because because we we live in a very intellectual kind of society, but it's kind of got an exciting intellectual time to be 
you know combining all these different fields and working with them at the same time and um i think what I, what I mean is we live in quite we've my generation well i'm 36 i mean i've been brought up within the materialist paradigm so the the main way of um uh thinking about the world is that kind of logical framework so that's why there's a i think there's a there's an audience for work like yours because you're working with logic and ideas but you're doing it in such a way that you know you're working with that paradigm shift i actually think this focus on on the intellect on, mm. on, on logic is is a weakness of our culture of our civilization today mm. because it neglects many other mental functions that are very useful and very important it neglects intuition it neglects uh, personal insight it neglect, neglects imagination mm. um i think earlier human beings were more complete in their way of grasping nature through multiple mental functions at the same time, including our ability to, to articulate our thoughts about nature in a symbolic, metaphorical way. Mm. And I think we've sacrificed all that. Uh, but given the reality that this is what our culture today focuses on and emphasizes, yeah. it's nearly the only thing we value and believe in, then I accept that as a as a circumstance of my time and I work within those constraints that's why I focus so yeah. much on logic and empiricism but but also what's I mean one of the other books is all about myth isn't it and what you're using in materialism baloney is metaphor and image and symbol so you're kind of got one foot in in both camps in a way haven't you Th that's right my, yeah. my newest book which is coming out this year from yeah. if books um, is, is completely on the, the, the hardcore philosophy and science path. It's basically a com largely commented collection of academic papers that I have published over the years. Um, but then my previous book was about religious myths. Mm -hmm. And my point there was religious myths, so long as you don't interpret them, them literally. If you mm -hmm. interpret them literally, you, you kill them. Yeah. You basically squash them into not even a shadow of what they are supposed to be. If you open your mind and interpret them symbolically, religious myths, they have much to tell. They convey an understanding that not only is aligned with what we can uh, uh, produce intellectually based on empirical evidence and hardcore logic and so on, mm -hmm. not only it's consistent with that, it goes beyond it. It gives a color and a depth of understanding of what can be achieved rationally that transcends what can be achieved rationally. It's just a matter of having the eyes to read it the right way, to, to, to read it by using these other mental functions we have at our disposal. The problem is that both religious fundamentalists and atheists, they destroy the religious myth by taking it literally, by squashing it into a shadow of what it's supposed to be. And then they have a sort of a, a, a silly war. It's like, uh, you know, a war between two blind soldiers while you're standing there looking at that and thinking what the hell is going on here this is so silly but anyway yeah no um i i agree with you you're preaching to the choir i think i i i think this um i think and you make it in your um in uh, your myth book uh, that tell me the title so uh more than allegory more than I, allegory I have, yeah. a, I have a copy here on religious myths truth okay. and belief I know because I think exactly what you said. If um, I was kind of told, often told that those myths were made up by people who weren't so were a bit more ignorant to explain things, kind of literally. But uh, but actually, when you shift your focus to a more imaginative focus, like you said, there are like not a literal truth, but but eternal truths that you said, which give depth poetry and yeah meaning which yeah. which you can't get solely from the hard yeah, I think, uh, you see when, when we when we read and interpret a scientific theory mm. the theory is trying to tell us what things are yeah. when you read or interpret a religious myth the myth is trying to tell you how things are like mm. and that's very different it's very different the myth is telling you how things are like. The myth is pointing to something that cannot be said directly. It's just pointing at it. Uh, but if you keep looking at the finger instead of what it's pointing to, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're not going to make much progress. I like that point. Point. Think what things are like and pointing to things which cannot be said directly. I think that's yeah. why often when you read ancient myths, 
sometimes they're hard to understand on the surface but on some level they speak to you and you think wow i don't fully understand this story sometimes but i but but these stories i still love reading them and they're kind of wild but they speak to me on quite a deep level because they are touching yeah, one way to, one way to look at them is you see imagine that you wake up in the morning and you just had an amazing intense dream mm. an absurd dream but very intense that spoke to you emotionally very strongly when you wake up in the morning you don't ask you don't think of the possibility that the dream was literally true mm. that uh, the images that you got that were so evocative that they were all there there, there was to the to the dream mm. no it's not what you think what you do is you ask yourself what did that mean yeah. what did that represent what was that pointing to mm. uh, the thing it was pointing to was something that was in a way in a sense like the dream but mm. it wasn't the dream yeah. the dream wasn't its own meaning it, it the dream has to be interpreted you have to look past the dream beyond the dream to see what it was pointing to for dreams we grasp that that immediately we uh, everybody will understand and feel what I'm saying because everybody mm. has that experience yeah. but when it comes to religious myths we lose that uh, innate intuition because culture has crowded it out um, we, we lose that capacity to mm. ask ourselves from the religious dream the same question we ask about the dream we had in the morning which is what does it mean what is it pointing to I know that this is not literally true like the dream was not literally true but it has been very evocative like the dream has been very evocative so what does that mean what is yeah. it trying to point to lovely yeah and I've also someone said you can also think how has that happened to me that's one way of thinking it like has this this story about this ancient king or queen has that happened to me in some way and that starts to get you thinking a bit more symbolically and and poetically yeah. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I think those are the key words to think symbolically and poetically. Yeah. yeah, lovely. So that's the symbolic and poetic side, and what's coming out this year on if books. What's the focus on there? Uh, the focus is uh, on the academic world. Yeah. Um, I have written six books now, uh, focusing on you know the average educated person uh, yeah. from the streets. Um, it's very difficult to reach those people uh, and the reason is there are so many voices in the world today um, coming through you know social media alternative media uh, it becomes a cacophony of voices mm. and and quite frankly if you don't mind my English there is a lot of bullshit out there you know the outright nonsense yeah. um, and it's very noisy uh, nonsense um, so it, I, it I, the, what I feel is that it becomes very difficult to to differentiate myself from that because you see you cannot expect from the average person on the streets even intelligent educated people mm. uh, that that they will invest the time and the discernment it takes to sort you know the nonsense from the valid although very counterintuitive ideas yeah uh, it's very difficult to, to make that distinction especially when you're sort of when you have this cacophony of nonsense um, so what I figured is uh, the only way I have to differentiate myself is to go to academia and yeah. to publish in hardcore academic journals and to go to hardcore academic events and to dialogue with hardcore yeah. academics and to show that uh, in that company I am heard too yeah. so I'm not talking nonsense so the book that's coming out this year reflects this effort it's a collection of um, 10 uh, academic papers uh, published in leading academic journals and that they bring together I always had a plan to write these 10 papers as if they were chapters of a book I never told that to the uh, to the editors of the academic journals where they were published they, they are all self-contained yeah. but they were thought out from the beginning to be a sort of a, a, a global storyline so I'm bringing them together and I'm adding a lot of commentary to weave these papers together uh, into a coherent overall storyline, mm. uh, overall story arch that brings a strong argument forward. Nice. And well, personally, I mean, I think, you know, your effort is wonderful. I think I think um, I know one way to differentiate yourself is also talking to us on channels like Over It Presents because, um, you know, to hear you speak and to see you see you talk is a great way of uh i think i hate to use that word selling yourself or showing 
differentiating yourself. <laughs> I just want to communicate. Yeah, yeah. 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 Fantastic. And if uh, if people want to know a little bit more, want to look at your full range of books because your prolific output, then a bit more. Um, where can we find you? And um, like, are you up to anything particularly at the moment? Um, I'm up to a, <laughs> up to a lot of things. <laughs> Um, um, I think this, the, the, the central point, people can go to my website, that's uh, Bernardo Castrop, one word, dot mm, com, yeah. Castrop with a K and a P at the end. Um, and there uh, on my site, there is a sort of a menu bar at the top, and there you can look at uh, my academic papers. All my books are linked in there, my videos, uh, my discussion forum. Um, I have a link to my, my column on Scientific American. I don't have a formal column, but I'm a regular contributor to Scientific American magazine. Mm. And there's a link there to all the, the, the articles I have published on Scientific American. Oh, th that's important. Uh, what, I, what I try to do in this latest phase of my work is I publish very hardcore academic papers first mm. in yeah. hardcore academic journals. They are very much difficult to read for the average person. But then what I do is I, I write a thousand word, thousand two hundred word summary of each of those papers mm. in my much easier language, much more accessible to any average educated person. Mm. And I publish those on Scientific American. So if people are curious about, uh, you know, summaries of uh, understandable summaries of my hardcore philosophy and science work, mm. go to Scientific American and it is all sort of made easy there. Fantastic. Go to Scientific American, uh, and I think that you know we're, we, the world needs you know people who, who can engage at that level, the hardcore journal level, and also have the ability to put it into intelligible, clear terms. I think that's really important. Without jargon. Yeah. yeah without jargon. But no, it's such a pleasure to talk to you, and inspiring, and um, you know, I feel energized by by your work and your your ideas, and I you know I wish you the absolute best with the new projects and and um, your writing going forward. Thanks a lot, Ben. It's a, it was a pleasure talking to you.